Hey everyone, my name is Eric Escobar, and today I'm going to be talking about low power and long range communications, also known as QRP. So this is going to be just a quick overview of the subject of QRP, um, some of the considerations to make, why you might want to take a look at it, digital modes, configurations, and pretty much just a really good skybox view um, if this is something that you're in potentially interested in getting more involved with. So uh, I get the question quite often, what is QRP? QRP basically used to stand for uh, a Q signal of shall I reduce power, but it's been really adopted right now at this point of low power operation. Uh, QRP basically stands for five watts of output power uh, if you're operating CW or 10 watts um, if you're doing uh, single sideband. Um, now, the funny thing is, is if you're not a ham radio operator or you know, computer enthusiast, five watts uh, may not mean a whole lot to you. But that power is, is even less than what your wall charger for your cell phone operates at. So th that's pretty amazing when you think about it, that you can do long-range communications of several thousand miles on just five watts of power. Uh, and, and when I go into the specifics of, of how that works, and um, you, know, you can see the image a little bit below, which is a quick preview of bouncing you know, waves off of the ionosphere, it's really interesting and shows a lot of different characteristics that uh, many individuals, ham radio operators, not ham radio operators, um, you know, they may not be familiar with. And, and so why even QRP? This is a question that I get a lot. It's a question that, um, you know, that when people ask, hey, why are you ham operator? And, you know, what, what does that even do for anything in real life that, that matters? Everybody considers, uh, you know, at least my friend, my friend groups, consider ham radio to be an old hobby, you know, from the late 60s, 50s. Um, you know, when there wasn't internet, when there wasn't a way to do long distance communication easily. Uh, but really for me, uh, QRP, low power operating, it helps you hone your craft. It helps you know your equipment, knowing, knowing how your configurations are set up. Um, it allows you to get out in the field. You're not stuck at a home station or a home base with a giant antenna. Uh, it, can, it can help you be stealthy, you know, if you're living in, in a neighborhood um, that has HOA problems as far as putting up massive antennas or uh, you know, maybe your wife or husband doesn't like an antenna sticking up out of, you know, the, the backyard. Uh, this might be something to definitely look into. And then also there, there's grid down. Um, you know, so say, say there's electricity out, a solar flare, you know, a, a coronal mass ejection. Um, you know, you could potentially operate and communicate with people outside of your uh, near area. Um, but really what this comes down to is, is looking at how wireless waves, how wireless signals um, how RF, how it operates, how it works, uh, you know, when you're operating with low power. Because at any point in time, you can just crank up the power if you are a ham radio operator and go up to 100 watts and blast your signal all around the world. But really, uh, that's not that's not operating with your equipment. That's that's not you know pushing yourself to the limit. And really learning um, how to operate in low power modes with with you know maybe uh, self handicapping yourself. Um, what this gets you is it gets you the ability to, to learn how radio waves propagate, how they reflect, refract off of the ionosphere. Um, and it's a lot of, a lot of these uh, lessons that you can basically take from low power operating and extrapolate them into actual world of, of RF that um, might matter for your day job, say Wi-Fi, say Bluetooth, say any of these other small low power devices. Um, you know, just some of the lessons learned, uh, they, they become magnified when you go to much longer ranges. So just, just a little bit about that, I probably went longer than I needed to, but it's, it's important to me that before we go on with this conversation that you understand that, that operating QRP isn't just some, some niche thing for the sake of, um, you know, for the sake of it. It really helps in the, the larger grand scheme of things, when, especially if you're gonna operate at higher powers or with different types of, of radio frequencies. Um, it's a really good base and a really good place to get your feet wet. So what is QRP? I kind of mentioned it a little bit before. Uh, basically, this is mostly in the uh, HF bands. And the reason is because if you were to look at VHF or UHF, and, and that's going to be your 2 meter or 70 centimeter or, uh, you know, in the 144 megahertz range or 400 megahertz range, basically these, those types of, of frequencies, they can uh, pierce the ionosphere. So they don't get refracted off the ionosphere like the picture shows. This is why there's a lot of um, cube satellites that, uh, that operate in the VHF range uh, because their antennas can pierce the ionosphere. And likewise, if you're trying to communicate with them, if you're a base station, um, those signals can reach the, uh, reach the spacecraft 
Um, so you can, for example, digipeat off of the International Space Station. And the reason the signals can get through is because they can, they can pierce the ionosphere. Um, but that's really not great for long distance uh, terrestrial communications. Uh, and the reason why is HF is a much lower frequency. Um, and so being operating in those lower frequencies, say in like the 40, 40 meter band of like seven megahertz versus the two, the two meter band, which, you know, is the, like around 144 megahertz, um, those HF frequencies, they can refract off the ionosphere, which gives you what's called sky wave propagation. And if you look at the, the you know, image that I pulled off of Wikipedia, um, you can see that sky wave propagation basically bounces, you know, for lack of a better term, off of the ionosphere which allows you to go around the curvature of the Earth. So many times when you think of um, radio communications, you probably think of line of sight. So if you have, say, walkie-talkies, um, or say you're going like ship-to-ship -ship communications, um, a lot of times those those communications have to be line of sight, or you have to be able to, um, you know, see the you know the potential other uh, the receiver of your signal. Um, and now where that can where that can be a bummer is you know the curvature of the Earth that gets in the way. Um, and you could only go, you know, potentially a couple hundred miles if you're, uh, you know, looking out from over a tower or a building or something along those lines. Um, and so basically with, with skyward propagation, you can get all around the world uh, by, by refracting off and bouncing off the ionosphere, um, as you can see below. Now, HF uh, propagation can be influenced by a lot of different things, which makes it really interesting. Um, it can be influenced by solar events. So right now we're at a solar minimum, which which uh, means that, that the propagation doesn't, doesn't really go as far or uh, uh, refract as well um, as if we were at a high solar, uh, um, you know, a high solar event time. Um, it's also influenced by time of day. So the ionosphere changes uh, with density and composition um, through day and night, through temperature swings. And so that, that's yet another uh, thing that we're, we'll look at going forward of, um, you know, what time of day or, you know, what, what different ways can you uh, propagate these signals off the ionosphere. Now, I'd also be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, NVIS, or I think it's near vertical incident skywave, maybe? Uh, I, I don't know that off the top of my head. But essentially what that is, is you'd be bouncing off, off the ionosphere and coming straight down. So you'd be talking to individuals in your, in your local vicinity of a couple hundred miles. Um, but it, again, this is really interesting because the, the composition of the ionosphere mixed with um, you know, the frequencies of the HF band uh, or multiple HF bands allows you to refract that signal and again send it all over the world. Um, and again, maintaining super low powers of, of five watts, um, which is quite incredible. Again, that's that's less than what your cell phone takes to charge. Um, so let's talk about some of the radios that that you might get involved with and you might be interested in checking out here, um, and some of the considerations to make. First would be weight. Obviously, if you're going to use QRP to basically take this radio on the go. Um, you can see the example of my ICOM uh, 705, which is in the top right. Um, that radio is, is made to be portable. It's made to, you know, it has the handles on there so I can go stuff it in a backpack and go on a hike with it uh, and, and take it somewhere. Um, so again, weight is a, is a big consideration for me. Uh, modularity, um, you know, what other cables, what, you know, what operating modes are you going to have? You know, what, what other things do you need this radio to have? You know, do you want it to have, um, you know, an onboard battery perhaps, or do you want to provide the battery yourself? Um, are there any required peripherals? Do you need additional sound cards? Do you need something like a Raspberry Pi to perhaps um, you know, help you operate that digital mode or uh, as you can see my surface um, in the screen above? Then also expandability. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of QRP radios, a lot of low power radios can uh, have an amplifier attached to them so you can operate them as a uh, normal ham radio with much higher powers. Um, and so if that's something that you're interested in, then definitely take a look at, at you know, what, what pairings can be made with different um, uh, amplifiers. Um, and then antenna, antenna types are, is, is a huge consideration to make of. Um, different antennas have all different sorts of, uh, you know, radiation patterns that can help you reach out to contacts, you know, far, far away. Um, so again, we'll, t we'll cover a lot of these uh, going forward. So some radios that are really popular in the QRP community are the Zygu uh, G90. Um, $500, it's, it's pretty reasonably priced. Um, same thing with the, the Yaesu 818, uh, $650 a little bit more. Now the ICOM 705, uh, which is my favorite radio, which I'm totally not biased at all, is, is $1,400, which is really expensive um, you know, when you compare it to the previous two. But uh, there's a lot of things that are included in it that I think it make it that price point. Um, uh, definitely relevant and definitely something that that shouldn't uh, make it, you know, thrown out of your wheelhouse or something that you would like to pick.
Um, and there's also the Elecraft, the, the KX3 or KX3. Those are also great radios. I just didn't mention them here. Uh, there's also a new one on the market um, that I've seen from Lab 599. It's the TX500. Uh, this radio looks really, really rugged. I don't think it's yet approved um, from the FCC, so I don't think you can buy it in the United States yet. Um, but that's definitely something to keep on your radar if this is something that's interesting to you. So now talking about uh, different antenna can considerations and configurations. Again, weight is really important. Uh, where you're going to be operating is also super important. Um, so for example, uh, I think I think a great uh, uh, antenna for if you're going to be in a in a treed area or area of trees or something where you can um, you know loop your loop your antenna wire over would be the uh, the KM4 ACK. So it's um, it's his antenna that, that you can just if you Google it you can find it's an uh, NFED half wave antenna. And as you can see, it's a really handheld, uh, really lightweight antenna. Um, you know, the, it's it's a DIY kit that you buy, but it's only $40. Uh, and this antenna, you can go you know, thousands of miles on, on again, 5, 10 watts, uh, no problem. Um, and it's super lightweight, so you can stuff it in a backpack um, or even have it as a backup antenna. It's, it's really great. Um, you know, other considerations that you might want to take into account, uh, you know, if you're going to use, um, like, say, uh, a whip antenna, you know, are you going to need a tuner? Are there trees nearby? If there are no trees, then you might want to use a whip or something like a mag loop antenna. Um, then also the operating modes. Are you going to do uh, you know, single sideband? Are you going to do uh, digital modes? I prefer digital modes. That's what I'll be covering mostly here in this, um, you know, in this presentation. Um, you know, what are your operating conditions? If you're going to be inside, for example, say you live in an area where you get frequent thunderstorms, uh, you might want to take uh, the mag loop into consideration because that can stay inside of your house. Um, it can operate inside of your house. It doesn't have to be high up. Um, and so it, there's, there's you know, very little risk of lightning damage um, if that's something you want to operate inside. Um, and then if, if you're interested in, say, getting like a kit that uh, kind of has a mix and match of a bit of everything in it, the Empass 2.0 made by Chameleon is an awesome, awesome kit. Um, it includes uh, NFED half waves um, or a NFED half wave as well as a whip and all the different configurations and counterpoise that that come along with it. Uh, definitely a great kit. It's it's a bit pricey, but um, again, buy once, cry once is, is kind of my motto of I would much rather have an antenna that that I can really depend on that works really, really well. Um, so I'm not always second guessing, hey, is, is it something to do with my radio, my operating, or is it, um, you know, something, some malfunction with the hardware? So again, these are all of these different considerations you want to take into account of, you know, what does your landscape look like? If you're operating from home, do you have tall trees that you can do, uh, you know, a sky loop antenna? Um, do you have, uh, you know, places where you can mount a, a pole or a mast? Um, do you have any HOA regulations where maybe you want to be cognizant of what your neighbors are going to think? Um, and again, the, the nice part about QRP is that none of these radios have to be um, super large uh, or, you know, have, you know, it's, it's not going to be your typical giant tower of, of operating that you see in many more high power situations. Um, so again, tons of different consideration to take into account. Uh, do your own research, obviously, but these are just uh, some things that have worked out really, really well for me. Um, so then uh, also, if you want to talk about uh, if you're going to use a whip antenna um, and you need an antenna tuner, again, I like the, the AH705. I think it's purpose built for the ICOM705. So surprise, surprise, uh, you know why I like it. Um, you know, it can also help out if you're just using a random length of wire that you want to use as your antenna um, strung up. Uh, the other thing to take into account for um, uh, an antenna tuner is the battery usage because they'll also take, um, you know, either their own internal batteries or if you have to hook them up to um, the battery that you're operating with with your uh, radio. Again, just, just something else you want to take into account that that will use some additional battery. Um, so now talking about uh, digital modes, um, right now we're in a solar minimum, uh, which means that that really propagation is is pretty tough. It's not you know what it what it used to be. And again, uh, you know, good solar times will come back. So so this is not something to focus on for for a long time. Um, but really, just I kind of wanted to to depict in this image here, um, just how far you can get on on five watts. So you can see that that regularly I can uh, I can communicate with you know. So I live in California. And regularly, I can communicate with stations, you know, over over 2,000 miles away. I think the longest communication that I've ever made um, was around 3,500 uh, miles. Um, and that, that was, again, on 5 watts, which is absolutely incredible to think that you can communicate with somebody on less power than your cell phone takes, uh, you know, almost, you know, on, on super far away from you, right? Um, up to 3,500 miles, at least as far as I've gotten. 
Uh, and there's a lot of different operating modes. I, I, I like digital for, for a couple different reasons. Uh, one, I can do them in the comfort of my home and I don't have to worry about interrupting uh, the kids or my wife. Um, so that, that's, again, why I personally really like them. Uh, you know, the different programs that you can use are WSJTX or JSA Call. Um, WSJTX uh, has FT8. FT8 uh, is um, 8FS, or it's based on 8FSK, and FSK is uh, frequency shifting. Um, it's, it's a little bit like FM modulation or frequency modulation, uh, not, not quite exactly the same. Um, but really, what FT8 is great about is about, uh, it, it's great when you have um, uh, really tough solar conditions and really, you know, um, you're, you're operating QRP and you really want to get a signal out. Uh, it's really slow. You know, you can, uh, you know, it's, it's you know, only a couple words um, per minute that you can get out. So it's pretty darn slow operation. But the, the benefit of that is that as, as error correcting built in, so um, you can really get that signal out. Now, uh, built kind of on the heels of, of WSGTX is JSA Call. Um, now, I, JSA Call is, is, is one of my absolute favorite applications for this. Um, however, not as many people operate JSA Call as they do WSJTX, uh, you know, and FT8. So on, on one side of the spectrum, you can get, uh, you know, the preferred application of JSA Call. Um, you know, but there's not going to be as many uh, users or, you know, not as many operators uh, using it, um, which you can tell if you go to the website, uh, PSK Reporter, you can see who's operating um, what stations and what's being reported uh, to the internet. Uh, another mode that you can operate on if, is Whisper if you want to see beaconing and just how far the signals go out. Whisper is really great for, for kind of um, judging the conditions of the ionosphere and judging, you know, just how far you should be able to reach out. And so what you can see from gray line, if you're not familiar with it, is essentially uh, you know transition from daytime to nighttime or nighttime to daytime, and the effects that that has on the ionosphere really do help um, you know your propagation and you reaching out to those farther distances. Uh, and so again, this this picture is a great example of that. That's why I included it here. So now I, I'm completely biased on the ICOM 705. It has a lot of features in it that. Um, that I think definitely make it worth the price point and, and worth um, so, you know, some consideration. And obviously this is not sponsored in any way, shape, or form by, by ICOM, but, um, but just some things to be made aware of. Uh, it, is, it has Bluetooth on board, which is great because you can put in a Bluetooth headset and you, know, you can chat over that um, if you're going to use voice. Um, it also has Wi-Fi client and Wi-Fi access point mode. Now, this, this may seem pretty niche, but it's really cool when you think about it. Um, and what client mode allows it to do is client mode allows you to basically connect your ICOM 705 to your home Wi-Fi network or to potentially a mobile hotspot and allow it to interact with other network devices um, that are on your, that, that share your network. So that could be a phone, that could be a tablet. Um, you know, there's a ton of different things that that can do. Now, if you're operating portable, you can also uh, set it up in access point mode. Uh, what's nice about access point mode is, um, you know, you can just connect a device directly to it. Now, obviously, you, you won't get internet when you connect to it to its access point. But uh, an inter interesting consideration is that you can set up your, um, you know, your radio, and then you can basically take a, you know, your phone, uh, a tablet with you, and have it connected to that access point. So you can set up your radio in a convenient location, but then just operate from a tablet um, as you walk around, you know, your local vicinity, your local area. Um, it, it's it's a really kind of a neat feature that you can that you can remote control your radio um, from not too far away. Uh, another thing that, that's great about the ICOM 705, it has GPS on board, um, which I really like. It helps, you know, sync everything up, uh, do your grid locators. Um, also has an SD card on board, so you can just record straight, you know, you know, contacts, um, audio, whatever you want to that on, on board SD card. Uh, and it has a modular battery. Now, with the modular battery, you can only transmit um, at 5 watts. But, hey, I mean, this is this QRP, so the, by definition, that's, that's all we really need. Um, however, if you do plug it into a power source, uh, you can uh, go up to 10 watts. Um, you can go up to 10 watts with without needing an amplifier. And anything greater than 10 watts, you'll need an amplifier. But the modular battery is kind of neat because you can buy multiple batteries if you want to keep them on hand. Um, and it allows you to you know swap them in, swap them out uh, if, if you want them that way. Uh, again, for, for me, the ICOM 705 is a buy once, cry once um, type of radio. It, it has a ton of features, a, a lot more than what I mentioned here, but it really helps for, for how I operate and what I like to do. And, and, and again, I can take my tablet inside my house, um, you know, not hooked up, you know, in the shack somewhere. And I can operate just sitting on the couch while watching a movie with hanging out with the, the, you know, the kids and the family. 
Um, and so it really makes, uh, you know, ham radio a hobby that I can, that I can do from anywhere, um, you know, while, while inside and while, um, you know, still being present, right? So again, one of those things that uh, if it means you use your radio uh, a lot more frequently and you get a lot more comfortable with all of your gear because you can actually use it um, where you want to, uh, I, I think it's well worth the price. So how I operate, just a little bit about it. I'm not going to get uh, super deep in it. Um, I mentioned a little bit, I operate off of an old Microsoft Surface. I don't need anything that has a lot of horsepower. Um, I also can use a Raspberry Pi in my phone. That's a pretty darn good uh, combination as well. I love Raspberry Pis and um, all the different features and, and even the horsepower that they have now with the Raspberry Pi 4. Um, so again, I can connect uh, my ICOM 705 directly to my my main home Wi-Fi network, or or again, like I said, to a hotspot. And why that why that's neat is that you can interface with that radio from other devices on your network, um, and you don't you don't have to you know worry about plugging in um, you know direct USB cables to it. Uh, and it also helps you when you want to stay and you want to stay uh, portable, um, or if you're just going to stay at home, you can operate both of those modes, and you don't really have to change a whole lot up. Um, and another thing too that I, that I that I didn't mention is that if you're interested at all in UHF or VHF, uh, the ICOM 75 also has that built into it too. Which again, it's it's a, a fully it has it has just so many features there that I definitely think it's worth that price point. Now, um, I, I didn't talk a whole lot about JSA Call versus WS JTX, but JSA Call has heartbeat functionality, so you can um, you know heartbeat out out you what your where your station is and where you're located and what you're transmitting on. Um, to basically just get a feel for where you, those signals are propagating. You can also relay uh, direct messages to individuals or relay through other, um, through other stations if, if uh, another user is set up that way. And why that might matter, say you want to send a uh, you know, signal all the way around the world. If, if an operator is, say, halfway between that distance, they can store and forward that message using JSA Call, which, again, is, it's, it's a really cool piece of software that if you've never played with it, I definitely recommend it. Um, and, and again, I'll be in the Ham Radio Village, so if you're watching this now and you're interested in it, uh, I'll, I'll definitely let you poke around my, my setup and my configuration. So uh, thanks again, Jordan, for, for <laughs> building out that software. I think it's absolutely awesome. So um, by no means is this, is this anything exhaustive. Uh, really, my whole goal of this talk is to kind of to kind of show, hey, this is what QRP is, and, and this is you know why HF bands you know could be interesting to a uh, you know a newly minted technician uh, you know ham radio operator. You know, it, it's a good reason to look at getting your general. It's a good reason to look to getting your extra license. Um, so if, if this is something that's interesting to you, there's so many resources out on the internet that um, you know I could just do basically a full talk probably of all the different, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, resources out there. Um, I really like Julian's channel, the, the OH, uh, 8STN ham radio channel. Um, it's, it's awesome. He goes over a lot of ICOM 705 stuff and he also covers a lot of, um, you know, working off grid and solar and battery. Absolutely awesome. There's ham radio crash course is, is another great one that, you know, reviews a lot of different types of, of the, um, of the QRP radios that I mentioned. Uh, Cam 4 ACK, uh, the maker of that end to end half wave in that uh, in that picture down below. He also has a great YouTube channel with with a lot of QRP, um, you know, unpackings of, of his backpack and and just a ton of great advice in there. And you can see again his his end fed half wave is that that orange loopy printed one down below. Uh, and then again JSA call. There's if you just go Google JSA call. There's a ton of great resources and videos, um, you know, that that Jordan's produced and you know demonstrating showing. The software operating, um, you know, with with multiple different types of HF radios. So now what? Well, this is really a call to action. If you're a technician, upgrade your license. Uh, and if you're looking to get into ham radio, again, there's there's no better time uh, now than than to take a test. You can do it all pretty much online now. So again, if you don't have a license, get one. And if you have a technician, upgrade to your general, upgrade to your extra. Um, you you definitely won't regret it.